Right, that's a little little cropped, but I think it'll kind of do. Um, before I start, how many people uh, are with Broad Street right now? All right, we got a few. How many people have heard of Broad Street? All right, cool. How many people have thought about uh, getting involved with Broad Street? All right, cool. Kind of, kind of tally. Um, Broad Street's a uh, company we do ad serving and ad management. Um, typically, what DFP or OpenX has done in the past, which uh, you might know that they do. Um, if you have a plug in like Ad Rotate or something like that, uh, managing your ads, this is what Broad Street does. So you have a, uh, an ad campaign where uh, you've got an advertiser, ad is running, it runs you know, for six months, you want it to automatically activate, deactivate, collect metrics, things like that. Maybe you want the ads to rotate around your site, that's what we do at our core. But uh, we've been taking display advertising in the direction that we think it's going in. And uh, I want to talk about the future of display ads, specifically because um, there's been a lot of talk about the decline of display advertising, especially in local news. And I do think that there is going to be a decline, especially when it comes to this guy right here, um, which is your standard 300 by 250 display ad that gets 0.06% click-through rate on the internet. So I don't think it's a, uh, it's a secret that display advertising right now is, for the most part, ineffective. Um, we serve these things, but we've been peddling for most of our, most of our publishers the serving of these 300 by 250 display ads that really, if you make the sale, um, you go back to, you know, to renew the ads, and if your, your advertiser is savvy enough to actually look at the stats, they may not be impressed, or they may not be impressed that one out of every 1,000 people who saw the ad actually clicked on it. Um, so it's not really impressive. And uh, so, Broad Street, a few years ago, we used to talk about, you know, Making your site friendly to the IAB standard 300 by 250 ads, but we started to have a you know completely different idea about what makes an ad effective and where what we should be doing for our customers. So this is definitely not going to work very well on uh, the small screen right here. There's a page on our site where we kind of display all these new rich media ad formats that we've been building. So um, if you're not familiar with what rich media ad formats are, uh, you got these, those 300 by 250 banner ads are just plain images. That's in the sidebar, they don't do anything. Rich media formats um, are basically HTML, CSS, and they can do a lot of different things like this. So you can be very interactive, it works on all devices. and. Um, we actually did this at first because Howard OS at the Plebeian um, basically emailed me telling me about a dream he had in which an ad flipped over. <laughs> I was intrigued. And we didn't we didn't we didn't actually uh, we didn't build it for like a year because I was like, well let's you know, it's kind of like a one off feature. How are we gonna build that into our platform? But then what we did is we kind of built an engine for building these special ad formats. And we've been building them like crazy. So we have this this cute guy right here. Um, it's 3D, it flips around. And this is an ad format that you can create inside Broad Street, and all you need is like six photos and a logo. And the reason we're doing all this, actually I'll get to that in a second, um, the reason we're doing all this is, is that the performance is much, much better, and it also uh, relieves some of the friction in the ad set. I'll talk about that in a second, but I'll just go through these, uh, these different formats we have right here. There's a countdown, so if you have an advertiser who, um, you know, you hear that someone's gonna open up shop in, in four weeks or something like that, a lot of times we want to get to them first, and uh, that's what the countdown is for. There's, a, there's actually, this is an actual uh, advertiser in Red Bank, New Jersey. My favorite restaurant of all time is Tenta Burrito, and they are opening in Red Bank, and I kind of build a countdown just for them, and also because people have been hurrying me to build it for them. So, um, fly out, you've seen stuff like this, uh, the scratch off, which is kind of like, you know, those are more, more well-known ones. The coupon, advanced coupon, you can click on this, it works on mobile. So we have all these different ad formats, but getting back to why we're actually creating these things. Um, actually, I just talked about performance. You can see that the performance, you know, as opposed to that 0.06% click-through rate, 
the performance of these ad types is actually, it, you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 times performance of, of that original banner ad. So the roadblock, Tim Brady definitely uh, had some words for, for ads that pop up um, yesterday. But the thing is, you can't argue with 3.5%. You know, that's, that's an amazing click-through rate. Um, the listing cable wallpaper ad all the way down, even to, this is like, you know, at the bottom of the list, this is you know, significantly a better performer than a standard display ad. So this is this is all coming about, and the reason we're, we're kind of taking this approach to advertising is because there, there are these major players that we believe are going to be, you know, silently drawing revenue away from, from local news publishers. Um, Google AdSense, I really should have said AdWords there. Facebook may be the biggest. Um, they want small business advertising money as much as you did. Uh, they're making it very easy for, for businesses to boost their posts, to run their posts as ads. And uh, I think that they make it so easy to advertise that they may start drawing away if they're not already doing it. Um, Yelp, Groupon, there's a lot of competition. There's so much competition when it comes to selling ads. And if we think about this from, from your perspective. We think, what can Broad Street do that makes what you're selling better than what Facebook is doing? What makes, we want, we want to make what you're selling better than all of the other options. And if you ask most pu uh, publishers um, what makes them different from other publishers, what, why should someone buy an ad with you as opposed to the patch or you know the, the legacy newspaper in town? Most people will say, oh, well, our audience is, we have the best audience in town, or our content quality is just so amazing that you know people stick with us and they never go to that other guy. Our relationship with advertisers is, is really strong. I think that's a, that's a good one. But what we want to do is add these to your list. We want so, so that you can say, we have the best performing ad products. And not only the best performing, they're the best value because we drop them at a price and nobody else can really match. So our strategy is basically just keep changing the game, keep doing things that will keep those ads high, high performing. I, I showed you that cube before. That cube is not going to be a high performer forever. Eventually, people are going to start seeing the cube enough and they're going to know it's an ad. But the reason we built this platform is so we keep pumping out these different ad formats that work for you guys that keep the engagement rate high and performance metrics high. So that's what we're trying to do, just keep changing the game and keep giving you guys something that um, that you can use to sell. And the reason that's, that works so well is that Facebook's never going to have a, a rotating cube ad on, on their site. They're, they're going to have a slight variation on the news feed ad. In fact, the internet blew up when they had that like animated GIF ad. Yeah, I don't know if you saw it, it looked like a still image, but something was moving. I forget what the name of it is, but that, that was a new Facebook ad format. People lost their minds over it. It's not even that exciting. Um, so, so innovating at that pace, at Broad Street's pace, uh, doesn't scale very well. When we released the Cube ad, Josh Williams at Tennessee Sun, he went out and he sold one within like a week or something like that. And then at the end of six weeks, I think he sold six. He posted on the Facebook community group, but he said, I, just, I have six of these running on my site. There were 200 bucks a piece. All they needed was six photos and a logo, so there's no designer needed. And so that's like this 1,200 a month extra that he has flung through his, uh, his site now. And his, his competition can't do that. <coughs> you know, like Facebook's never going to be like Google AdSense and an Exchange cannot traffic a, a cube ad through an exchange just because you don't know where it's landing, you don't know if it's going to actually work where, wherever it's, it's finally delivered. So you can't really you can't really flow rich media ads through an exchange like that. So when I was talking about the, the original premise of this talk was you know, the local publisher advantage, the advantage is really that you can, and Jim Brady touched on this yesterday, you're so small that you can you can change your ad strategy and your sales strategy so rapidly um, based on what's available to you. And we're trying to make as much as we can available to you. So just to give you an idea of, um, of what it's like actually creating these things, I will, let's just say, you know, turn that burrito. So actually, you know what, I, uh, I set something up ahead of time. I saw all those Lion King posters around Philadelphia when we came in. So let's just say, you know, you're running a site in Philly and you want to get to the Lion King first. The first poster you see, or the first hint that the Lion King is uh, coming to town. I need to know live demos always go spectacularly well. So. <laughs> All right, so this is basically what it looks like. We'll do countdown. Um, I just search for countdown. You can see the different ad formats in our in our uh, collection here. We have about 30. And uh, our, our goal is to uh, basically build the largest collection of rich media formats that we possibly can. So I'm thinking hundreds. 
Um, so we'll just say Lion King. Let's see. <laughs> Um, right. All right, let's see what else we need. We need a logo. Background. All right, let me just double check to make sure. Uh, we have an event date. This is, we're just going to leave that as the default, set to like November or something. But, um, <coughs> create the advertisement, see what happens. So I think it's fair to say that's with me about, um, oh, I know what I can change right here. I can change the width of that logo. But altogether, this is taking me about, you know, two minutes to create this ad. So like, the, that's the ad. And once, once I create this, I have, a, I have a site set up, some of you might know about Blargo, which is kind of like a WordPress template for rapidly creating news websites, does a whole lot of things like that. So I can just type, let's just say I want to show the advertiser a, I want to show the advertiser a demo. Whoops. <coughs> I give them a live preview of the ad on the page. So in two minutes, I created the ad. Uh, didn't take, you know, much effort all I needed was an image and um, you know a logo that I got from Google and then I created the app. And now this is like a private URL that you can show. So within two minutes you can mock up an ad and send the advertiser something to show them the ad on your site. So you know what does all this give you? You know this is how we're trying to help ourselves. We're always trying to think you know what's going to work to your benefit. Um, you get there first because you created the mock before anyone else did. You impress the advertiser. They haven't seen an ad that's interactive and you know ticks down on the page while they're sitting on it. Um, the users, if they want to, if they want to change the messaging, you can allow them to log in and change the creative mid campaign. If they want to change, you know, the, the launch date or they want to change the logo or you know the, the description or something like that. And uh, at the end, because these things actually perform really well, you promote the chance of renewal because you know they open and then it's finally like, hey, do you want to? you know, sign up for a longer term campaign. So going forward, uh, I talked about how we want to build, you know, the biggest collection of rich media formats on the internet, but how many people remember Editable Ads, which was like our first product. We showed up to, um, showed up to Block by Block like three years ago, pushing these Editable Ads. That's how we got our start. Basically, you, uh, it was a, a 300 bucks any size ad that you really wanted to, but you could change the image and the text inside the ad from Facebook. So an advertiser could, or a restaurant could post a picture, of, you know, really attractive picture of food and say, this is our special for tonight. Come down to, uh, you know, Bob's. And it, the, the creative on the publisher's website would automatically be updated with that latest messaging. So you could constantly be changing it up. And the click-through rates, because the ad was always fresh, was, was you know, they were much higher. It was like, you know, 0.5% as opposed to 0.1%. So going forward, you know, a project called Laser Beam, which we told about, we're like, oh, this is a top secret project, we started talking about it last year, but the ad formats have been such a priority, but Laser Beam is our eventual goal for, for all of our formats. So it's an iPhone app that your advertisers can use to basically, you know, update their creative, update Facebook. Think of it like as a buffer or a food suite from your phone. It will update Facebook, Twitter, and update their creatives on your site at the same time. Um, the ultimate goal is that you want to bring that real time, that social feel into advertising. Because imagine that there's a, there's a bar that um, I go to in Red Bank called Damien's and they have trivia night. And for the longest time, for six months, I didn't go to trivia night, even though I knew it would probably be right up my alley. And uh, just because I didn't know what it was like, I didn't know what the atmosphere look, was like. And my goal is to have someone like Damien who runs this bar to just take out his iPhone, take 30 seconds of video of trivia night, everyone having a blast and just say, hey, this is Jamie on a trivia night, it's now 10.30 on Wednesday, and uh, post that with laser beam, and it updates his ad. It could be automatic pre-roll, or it could just be something that you know sits in the sidebar, whatever it is. You bring the energy and that real-time vibe to advertising, because right now that doesn't exist. And advertising isn't interesting, it's not engaging, because that sort of real-time social vibe doesn't exist. Um, and ultimately, Facebook, one day, they're gonna allow publishers to basically book ads from their iPhone. I mean, they can sort of do it now, but it's kind of wonky. But the point is, um, it's not publishers, advertisers can book ads from their iPhone. Those small businesses, 
eventually they're going to make it really easy to promote their posts and really easy to run campaigns from their phone. And that's what we want to do with LaserBeam, make it possible for your advertisers. They do have something they want to promote. They can do it from an iPhone app. Um, and they can book an ad with you. Because self-serve doesn't really work yet, but it will work eventually. And I think that, that should be an eventual goal of LaserBeam. And lastly, email integration. Um, it should allow your readers, if they're interested in the updates that are flowing through the creatives, you know, if they're interested in all those updates coming from Jamie's, it should be, you know, potentially something you can integrate into your newsletter that shows up as something at the bottom of your newsletter, or maybe it goes out in a, a daily digest of the list of all the updates from advertisers in the area. The reason is because email is uh, undeniably the most effective for getting people to, you know, read and engage with promotional content. And then, this is totally irrelevant, but when you're going back to, and this is a Scott Broadback's idea, um, when you're going to renew and you know you see that that mysterious number of clicks, you know you got 106 clicks over the campaign, and that doesn't really tell anybody anything. In fact, it just could be it could be all fake. And what we want to do is actually give you insight into what the, who those clicks are from. All right, so at, least, at the very least, we can do we give you the IP address, we can give you an internet service provider, we give you the location where they're from, um, zip code if we can. So give you as much something to turn that mysterious click number into you know. More of a personality as opposed to you know something that seems like you know baking and spammy. So like, just to recap all of this, um, you know the original title was kind of like the local publisher advantage, which is is vague in a way. Yes, question. So do you do you remember where they're from? Do you eat them? No, we, we don't do that yet. Um, we don't do the click information yet. It's something that we 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 didn't do it for a long time because the old geo targeting. We had to get a provider for that and you know purchase a license. So. Um, that's what we did. But um, wrapping up, the, the like I said, the original title of the presentation was Local Publisher Advantage, but it's really, it's really that you guys are so small, you can adopt so early that you can start to use, you can use things like this, products like this, to change up your sales strategy before anyone else possibly can. And uh, you know, we're there to try and think of all the different ways that we can give you an advantage. Um, so anyway, any questions? Yes? I've got one. Thank you. This one? A lot of our concern with uh, reaching out to vendors is, you know, giving up a, a little bit of control. I'm always in favor of, you know, keeping as much of our data, as much of our information, you know, inside what we're doing. I don't like Facebook comments. I think, you know, that that information should belong to What's uh, Broad Street's sort of policy on all the data that you're gathering from, from the publishers? Right. Uh, I, you know, are, are you going to be like Google and leverage that somehow? No. In fact, we, we don't really collect any data. The only data that we have on our platform is basically clicks, views, and impressions. And the only time we ever share any sort of data is when, you know, like I, I gave you that chart of the performance of the different ad formats. And we'll give you the aggregate, you know, anonymous data showing you the performance of things, but we never share anything regarding actual customers. So are you collecting, or do you have, are you reporting, or are you showing cover data? Yeah. Yes. Do you have anyone people hover? Are you showing actual views that it was on the viewable part? No, we don't do that. So it, we still track classic ad impressions, but um, yeah, we don't, we don't you know, try and figure out if the ad was actually viewed or something like that. You know, if it's sitting at the bottom of the page, we kind of leave that up to the publisher to, you that's know. the big thing that's not Right, right, and that's not, that's not hard to track. Um, you know, as with, if you've noticed, like, you know, a lot of these different ad formats have things that, like, have, you know, different metrics for each that could be tracked. Like, that scratch off is, like, how many people actually scratch the ad. Like, we can't tell you right now. But that's something that we should be telling you. But obviously, there are some, like, data warehouse housing, you know, requirements that involve, like, infrastructure changes and things like that. So we want to bring the ads first and then worry about all the data collection things. Do you integrate with any of the other ad networks? Like, if you're running DSP, or you think you can call with this, or can they can call out the Right. If you're if you're using an ad network, you can certainly plug that into Broad Street. So if you know you're using AdSense or any exchange, you know you can have that running as a normal creative. Um, and then, vice versa, you can you can use all those special creatives. If you're already using a different um, ad server, you can use any of Broad Street's rich media creatives with the and OpenX and all those guys. Yes. Kind of two-part question, if you don't mind. How are you finding? Oh, How are you finding email response within millennials? Uh, right, I actually don't have any information on, uh, 
on email responses, so specifically with, with certain age groups. But I'd be interested to see if, to know if anybody is actually tracking that. You know, if there is like analytics for email, that'd be amazing. But um, what, what the, one thing I'd love to do with Broadstreet is give publishers a better idea of, for a way to connect. You know, through Google Analytics, you can figure out what the demographics you know of your readership is. But it's still almost impossible for you to connect that with your advertising to say, you know, um, you know, okay, fifty well, percent of our audience is, you know, is millennials and they're into cars or something like that. You know, how do you how do you translate that into you know targeting in, inside your ad platform? But still, that's still like kind of a, a gap that exists in this industry. And second half, um, what about do you have any idea um, just generally industry stats on how many people are using ad blockers, goes to read? Right. I hear it varies by country. Um, I hear it in, in uh, I think it was the Netherlands, I heard it as high as 10%. And uh, I get I get emails all the time from people. I rate that their ads aren't showing on their site. And uh, my first email is, do you have an ad blocker running? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, sorry. And I'm like, I, I think it's a, you know some karma right there. You're selling ads and you're running an ad blocker. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we actually, we have a blog post yeah, about that. that we, have a, we have an ad block detector. Um, so basically what you can do is uh, ad block has a list of definitions of things that'll hide on the page. So what you can do is you can put an element, you can just like call it like hashtag, you know, the element will say like ID is equal to ad, right? And that's one of those rules that ad block will automatically block that thing from display. And then you have some JavaScript like that checks, you know, a few seconds later to see if that ad, that thing's still showing and then you can show a message like, hey, turn off your ad blocker. Yeah. So we have we have a blog post about that, um, but I think they're really fast. And I think since we, we released that blog post, the um, the script that we're using was already added to the definition list of ad block. So that now like even the ad block blocker is blocked. So <laughs> it's a, it's an arms race between ad blockers. I actually have another question. And I know you haven't developed this yet, but uh, are there legal issues for a restaurant owner? That's a good question. Um, our policy is do it and then worry about it later. So um, I don't I don't know if that is an issue, but I'd be curious. You know, if you ever find out, like, <laughs> there might be a, a little bit of a, an issue there. That's not a news photo. You know, if you're in public, you can, it's made use for editorial use. That's perfectly legit. But if you use it like this for commercial purposes, that's, that's kind of another issue. Well, yeah, it, it really wouldn't be on the, the publisher so much. I mean, at, at that point, as a publisher, that's just more user-generated content. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've got some uh, protections there, but it would be on the rest of them. Yeah, it's something that's I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I know you check with our attorneys, and that is 100% an issue on the part of the creator of that ad. You don't have to release right. for those people's likeness and use it for promotion. I'm right. I give the whole ask forgiveness and then instead of permission. I mean, I do it all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> but just, after, I mean, that's, I would venture that that is definitely a fire beware. Or, you know, right. I'd, I'd be curious to where we fit into that if it's, if it's on the actual advertiser, you know, if they should know. Because, you know, a lot of restaurants will post their bars and post, you know, a, a shot of something, you know, a bunch of people in the place. And I doubt they're asking anybody. They're, they're doing it on Facebook yeah. already anyway, in, in a way. So. Right. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. But if they're smart, it's going to be snapped. Right, right. I don't think most of them think that. that customer will be identifiable mm -hmm. in the background. Mm -hmm. Right. I think there's a lot of like events and stuff. Like, you know, Red Bank just had a river fest, and that's like outdoor and public space. And so that becomes a little more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, we photograph you, our customer. We, you're our customer. We photograph you from over here in the street. And you your image in the hand. Right. <laughs> Can you make it our Kenny, I'm Lindy Buck with LizScalingNews.com, one of your very satisfied customers. I searched for a long time for a solution for my site that would um, provide ads, uh, and this has been a great solution. Uh, success story, I just landed a $3,200 contract um, because of this great portfolio. It's really, and I like the fact that because you have so much of a variety, um, you can offer that variety to your advertisers. It can switch it up and do a different ad every month. And, and that helps close the deal. Um, also, in regards to the videos, I love the YouTube ad. Um, and it's it's great because I have an electric utilities company that has television commercials. 
they have it on YouTube, so I would run their television commercial on my site. So, really effective. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, would you be able to just um, mention the uh, in content, the in story ad now that you have it? Right, right. Yeah, the in story ad, because you know, a lot of you know, a lot of sites are taking on that, that medium style of layout. You know, it's like sidebar lists, and it's just content. Um, so I was thinking, you know, how are we going to address that? Let me see if I can find it. Um, so this is just like the in content. I mean, you can customize it. You can change, obviously, the logo, the colors, the size, everything. But it's just something that you would just sit right in the content. You could size it as a 300 by 250 if you want. But um, the point is, it goes right in the middle of content, right in that, you know, that lead stream. But, and it's not something that depends on being in a sidebar, because that's something that, you know, um, oh, and it's also responsive, too, so um, if you're viewing on a phone or something like that, it, it, it kind of takes the, a different form. But, um, but yeah, that's, and, and we're, we're thinking a lot about that, too, you know, as we create these rich media formats. Creating formats that are friendly to mobile is, is gigantic. Um, and then you see the before and after. These are two different forms of it. This is like the stack version, which would go in your sidebar, and this is like the content version. So I think before, somebody had like a really gnarly uh, dentist picture. It was like the, you know, the snaggle teeth over here and the nice teeth over there. So um, it, was, it was, I think it was a great uh, visual representation, representation of what that, uh, actually, you know, another, a better one was a scratch off. It was like, you had some really nasty teeth and you scratched off and there were nice teeth underneath. It was, I don't know, really creative uses that I never imagined, so, yes. I just want to add, and thank you for the high level of I wish that everyone that I interacted with in terms of services on the comments site um, gave a kind of response. So thank you for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. We don't we don't usually get the feedback on like how well a sale went or something like that unless someone posted to the community groups. So I definitely appreciate that. And um, yeah, you know, that's one thing about Broad Street is that, you know, People say, well, why should I use you over DFT? And I'll be like, well, have you ever gotten a reply from DFT? And uh, you know, like, have you ever talked to anybody at DFT? Have you ever even gotten to ask anybody why you should use DFT over Broad Street at DFT? Um, so, You're you know, that's our approach. Yeah. <laughs> We've got time for one or two more before we uh, go have a, a snack. So. <laughs> even though you're right there with the mic. So, how are nonprofits using Broad Street? That's a good question. Um, I think they just they use it for the most part, like most other um, most other publishers. I, I know that there's something when we had editable ads. Um, I think the nonprofits had uh, a little bit of trouble with the updates because they couldn't let just anything run on their site. So the editable ad, you know, someone posts it on the Facebook, it automatically gets sent over to. Um, to the creative on the site, and you know they want to control the messaging. So I think the one change we've made there is that if if any advertiser is going to edit an ad, whether it's through the editable ads thing or they're just going to log in and, and change it, there's an approval required um, button that you can set where when they edit the ad, it kind of goes into a queue until you get a chance to you know the nonprofits get a chance to get around. It, and it is important for nonprofits to not be doing a, a whole lot of, you know, call to action advertising because then you start running into some trouble with the tax man. But, uh, we just uh, switched over to, to Broad Street to uh, basically take some load off our server and, uh, you know, we're just using it to basically run our sponsorship, uh, you know, banners. Anybody else? Or you're just uh, hungry? They look hungry. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you.